my characters have a number of sources. I mean, I read a lot of history, uh, so I draw characters from history, characters from current life, uh, people I know. Um, but ultimately, of course, I think you have to turn inward to give your characters real life. You have to, even if the character is nothing like yourself. And, uh, you know, a, a character like Sandy Blair, the protagonist of, of Armageddon Red, does share certain aspects of my um, autobiography. I mean, he and I both went to Northwestern. We were present during more or less the same years. We shared some of the same experiences. But when I'm writing about a, a, a dwarf of House Lannister or an eight-year-old Stark girl, obviously there, there's no autobiographical <laughs> uh, I've never actually had a dragon or been an exiled princess and all that. But you still have to try to get into the heads of whatever viewpoint characters in particular creating. Um, and to do that, you have to use your own feelings and your own emotions and your own thoughts about, okay, this I'm not like this person, but what if I was like this person? How would I feel about this? And, you know, to the extent that you know, anyway, I don't know any actual dragon writers, uh, but uh, I am, you know, you can go and talk to people about the uh, what an experience that you might not have had has, had been life. As I talked in Army of Ring, as I talked to uh, friends of mine who were in Chicago during the uh, 68 convention, or were present at some of these uh, you know, formative things, uh, the, the rock concerts in Army of Ring. Well, I didn't go to Woodstock or Altamont either, but my wife, Paris, was at Woodstock, so I could ask her what that was like to be at Woodstock and so forth. And, and Who'd you talk to for, for Joffrey out of interest? <laughs> <laughs> Joffrey, I knew a lot of assholes. present <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in all societies and, uh, and, and all, all cultures, I'm afraid, uh, around the world. <laughs> and of course, the other thing to remember about Joffrey is that he's a uh, Okay. You know, and this is particularly true, of course, in the, in the books. He's a, he's a 13 year old kid. Um, we played him somewhat older in the TV show, and of course, uh, the, uh, Jack Leeson, the wonderful actor who portrayed him, is, is even older than the character was supposed to be. But, you know, you really don't um, want to give a 13 year old kid absolute power of life and death over everyone around them. That's, that's a general rule. <laughs> and in, in terms of, uh, you know, looking inward, I mean, even a character like Joffrey, there's some of me in it, you know. What if I had been, you know, as a 13-year-old as a kid, um, God, there were other kids that I hated. If I had had the power to kill them, uh, <laughs> that's what I would have done. <laughs> Um, I could easily see making a couple of the school bullies back in Bayonne, New Jersey fight to the death. That would have been amusing. Uh, we all have this, this stuff inside us. That's something I try to get at when I write about my characters. Um, you know, fantasy, and I, and I love fantasy. I particularly love J.R. Tolkien. But I, I think he set up bad templates uh, for the lesser writers who would follow with the whole notion of the Dark Lord rising and calling all the evil creatures to him. And, you know, there are no redeeming characteristics to trolls or orcs or dragons in, in Tolkien's world. They're purely creatures of malice and destruction and uh, so forth. And good versus evil is a theme for all kinds of literature and has been since people have been telling stories and will continue to be for people to be telling stories. But I don't think that the battle between good and evil is necessarily fought between, you know, one group of noble heroes on one side who have nice white cloaks or white hats or whatever and, and on the other side a bunch of really ugly guys who, who wear black and smell bad. Um, it, the battle between good and evil is fought within the individual human heart, uh, between all of us every day and every year. And uh, people who do noble and heroic things on Tuesday may do something vile and selfish on Wednesday. Um, our lives are sequences of choices that we're constantly having to, to wrestle with, and that's kind of what I try to get at in 
in that. I even tried some of that with Joffrey. I mean, I, some people pick up on this. I know not all, but at the moment when when Joffrey is actually dying, I, I tried to give a instant of pathos there, where Tyrion, who's watching it happen, realizes this. He's seeing a 13-year-old kid in terror, choking to, to death before his eyes. Um, that's generally lost in the general glee, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, it's, it's there. I tried to work in that little grace note. You, you mentioned Joffrey and how he's older in the TV show, and the HBO show, and I wanted to ask you about, now that the show exists, and obviously there was a big time period between when you were writing the novels, and now there's sort of this whole other world of people who have learned about you and all of that through the show, how that sort of, in, if that's kind of had an influence on the writing you're doing now all the other conversations that are Well, it, it doesn't influence the writing I'm doing now, except to turn up the stress. Because <laughs> the show, of course, has caught up to me, which I didn't actually think would ever happen. I had such a huge lead, but uh, <laughs> the truth is that uh, I'm a very slow writer, and David and Dan are, are, and their staff are faster than I am. And I'm writing 1,500-page manuscripts, and they're writing 60-page teleplays. And you know, the production machinery is a is a locomotive that can't stop. So, uh, you know, I've been hearing them come up behind me for years, and and the, the question is, well, how can I make myself write faster? Well, I think. By now, the answer is I can't. I, I, I write at the pace I write, and, uh, and and there we are. But what the show is doing is not going to change what the book is doing. I, I, you know, I started writing about these characters in this world in 1991. We didn't even have the first meetings to create the show until like 2008. So I got like a 17-year head start. <laughs> Tyrion, Tyrion is Tyrion in my mind. Uh, to the rest of the world, he may look like Peter Dinklage, but uh, as brilliant as Peter is, and he is brilliant, uh, uh, my, the Tyrion in my head is still uh, not necessarily him. Is is he's, he's shorter he's and missing uglier, a nose and, uh, at this point too, I think, right? He's, he's, yes, and he's lost half his nose, yes, <laughs> which we couldn't do. We did think of doing that to Peter, but. Uh, <laughs> Peter was reluctant to actually let us amputate his nose, <laughs> and so if we did it with CGI, we would have to hear wear a little green snood for all of his scenes, and we would have to do it digitally, and uh, uh, that wouldn't, wouldn't have been very feasible. I'm intrigued to know, I mean, uh, you've often said that one of the kind of joys uh, when you sat down to write, uh, you know, initially in Game of Thrones and the rest of A Song of Ice and Fire was after so many years of being told by Hollywood what you're writing is too long and too expensive, you know, that's not really a concern when you're, when you're writing novels. Do you find now that your uh, books have been adapted into one of, if not the most expensive TV shows in history? Are you kind of like, now, you know, I, I'm going to really crank up, I mean, the, 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 the battle sequences will be absurd certainly larger than they've ever been before. Is that any kind of consideration to sort of be almost in? No, I, once again, I don't let, I, you know, I, I put the show aside. Um, I don't do that, and I also don't do reverse. I never throttle back and say, oh, this is going to be too much for the show. They won't be able to afford it. I better not do it. Um, I do it anyway, and then it's up to David and Dan and their people to, to figure it out. And sometimes they can, and sometimes they can't. Uh, you know, in the first season in particular, we lost a lot of the battles, for example, because we simply did not have the budget to stage battles. But as the show has gotten more popular and our budgets have increased, now we can do sequences like Hard Home and uh, Blackwater, pretty cool battles. I mean, Blackwater, uh, which I actually wrote the script for, um, adapting my own stories, is one of the best battles you know, that we've done, and I think you have to say it's probably at least one of the ten best battles that have done on television. Um, but as great as it is uh, in the TV show, it's, it's 
about a third of what's on the book. I mean, in the book, there's all sorts of elements. There's, you know, there's an entire other army that's on the other thing that's trying to come across in boats. There's, you know, the, the burning ships kind of locked together. They crash into each other and they form a, a bridge of boats and people are swarming across that. I've got five gigantic trebuchets that are throwing, throwing traders uh, across the river and bodies are falling out of the sky. And the ship. I've got a chain that goes across the harbor that they put on fire. Um, you know, lots and lots of elements that uh, we simply couldn't afford to do. But what they could afford to do was pretty cool. So. <laughs> I think one of the things, obviously, about the show also is there's a whole other world of internet journalism that is, and media coverage that is generated. And I wanted to ask, especially uh, as someone who was trained as a journalist, what to your view, you probably have, I think, a pretty unique perspective on how you're covered now. Yes, it's, it's, <laughs> oh, I have very mixed feelings about all of this here. <laughs> Game of Thrones is covered by a number of media outlets, by probably like 20 of them at this point, on a week-by-week -week basis. I mean, an episode comes out and uh, on Sunday night, and by Tuesday, we have 20 reviews of that episode from Entertainment Weekly and, uh, and you know, the, the Washington Post and the New York Times and, and uh, you know, on and on. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them um, that are reviewing us episode by episode, recapping the episodes, and then hundreds of people commenting on the episodes. It, it's a really an incredible level of attention. Um, you know, when I was a younger and, and growing up, I mean, nobody reviewed television shows, or if they did review television shows, they reviewed, you know, TV Guide would run a one-page review of the Dick Van Dyke show, and they would, like, be covering the entire show, you know, oh, this is a funny, pretty funny show, and Dick Van Dyke is good, and et cetera. Um, there wouldn't be this, this intense analysis every episode. And that's great. I mean, most of these reviewers are are terrific, actually, uh, and some of them are very perceptive. I mean, Mo Ryan, Jane, James uh, um, uh, Ponwiziak, Pan I can't ever say his name, um, Miles McNutt, who coined the term sex position, uh, and, uh, you know, several, uh, Hibbard uh, of uh, Entertainment Weekly, all excellent, and I, I look forward to seeing what they have to say about the, the shows as they come out. Um, and we're fortunate because we're one of the handful of shows that are covered like this. Uh, you know, Mad Men was covered the same way. Breaking Bad is covered the same way. Um, and that's great. But stepping back and taking off my guy who does Game of Thrones hat and putting on my journalism critic hat, I can't help but feel it's also vastly unbalanced because there are, this is the golden age of television. There's lots of terrific television doing out there. There's a show filming in Santa Fe called Manhattan that's a superb show. No one is paying Manhattan this kind of attention. No one is reviewing the Nick like this. No one is reviewing, I mean, most of the shows on the network, the only one that gets any attention is The Good Wife, and that gets nominated for Emmys, but uh, there, are, there are lots of other good shows. So it's like a feast or famine thing in this, uh, in this world of internet journalism, either. And maybe one of my gifts as a writer, but uh, also as a human being, is the ability to see the other side. So I'm very glad that our show is one of the ones that have been blessed, but I can't help but think, what if I was one of the shows where I was doing all this great work and nobody was paying any attention whatsoever? It would drive me crazy. It would drive me crazy. So that's half the answer. Now, <laughs> getting aside of reviewing the shows is, is the general quality of internet journalism in general, which I, I, more and more as I experience it, more and more I think it's appalling. It's appalling. And, and, you know, I, whatever journalistic standards I, I learned here at Medill certainly doesn't seem to apply on the internet anymore. I, I'm astonished by the things that I say when I read about them on these internet click, <laughs> clickbait things. And, you know, they're outrageous headlines and uh, 
taking things I've said, or uh, sometimes I think they make it up out of whole cloth. I mean, I, I read stories about myself. I've never, as far as I know, I've never even talked to this person or said anything. Where the hell is this story coming from? And yet, yet there it is. It's getting thousands of clicks and views, and then I'm having to do other interviews where I have to answer what I supposedly said. You know, what? where is the journalistic standards for this internet thing? Where, where is it? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, it's you know, they all should get a Medill F. <laughs> if they're getting it wrong. <laughs> um, so, oh, now that we're talking about Game of Thrones and the brand, how do you think um, the, the cultural and global impact of Game of Thrones is beyond the United States? Like, I know my friends in El Salvador know about it. People overseas know about it. What do you feel about like, the global impact of it? Well, they, you know, it's huge globally. It's, it's uh, you know, the most successful show HBO has ever had. Uh, I mean, um, I think a show like The Sopranos probably uh, was a bigger hit domestically, or at least was, and maybe that's not, even that's not true anymore. But well, right from the first, Game of Thrones has outperformed The Sopranos and other shows internationally. And even Emmy-winning shows like Mad Men and Breaking Bad, you know, terrific shows. Um, they don't perform that well internationally compared to what we've done. Uh, and I've reflected on why is that. I think there's a certain universality to fantasy. I mean, as great a show as Sopranos was, it's a show about a guy in New Jersey. Um, but swords and kings and dragons and magic, I mean, these are, these are uh, legends that are common to many cultures throughout the world. Uh, Virtually every civilization that we know of passed through a period where there were kings and lords and people fighting with swords and contending for, for dominance and trying to straighten out these things. And legends of dragons occur in, in you know, numerous different cultures. So I think that gives us a, a certain uh, universality that makes it translate very well into other languages. The books themselves are in more than 40 languages now, and uh, including some fairly startling ones. I mean, I, I just got some of the Mongolian editions recently. And, okay, I'm, I'm in Mongolian. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, I, we, I just signed an uh, Irish Gaelic. Uh, so they'll be in Gaelic. And um, you know, all, all my earlier books had, of course, been translated into the usual uh, the usual culprits here, uh, French and Italian and Spanish, um, but um, to, to get into these, these other countries all around the world is, is amazing.